What if I told you that one of the most battle-damaged bombers in World War II flew home with over 200 bullet holes, a missing tail gunner, and an engine that had been shot clean through, yet still landed safely? What kept that plane in the sky when physics said it should fall? And more importantly, what did one young gunner discover mid-flight that would change how America protected its bombers forever? The Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress wasn't just a plane, it was a promise. A promise that American boys could strike deep into the heart of Nazi Germany and come home alive. But that promise was tested every single day at 25,000 feet, where flak exploded like black flowers and Luftwaffe fighters came screaming out of the sun. Today we're going to explore why this legendary aircraft could absorb punishment that would obliterate any other bomber and how the observations of ordinary crewmen led to one of the most important statistical discoveries in military history. This is the story of survival, ingenuity, and the thin line between coming home and becoming another statistic in the deadliest air campaign ever waged. The Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress first took flight in July 1935, but it wasn't until December 1941, when America entered World War II, that this aircraft would face its true test. By 1943, the 8th Air Force was conducting daylight precision bombing raids over occupied Europe, and the B-17 became the backbone of that strategy. Each bomber carried a crew of 10 men, pilot, co-pilot, navigator, bombardier, flight engineer, radio operator, and four gunners, all crammed into an aluminum tube flying through hell itself. The statistics were brutal. In 1943, the average life expectancy of a B-17 crew was just 15 missions. To complete a tour of duty required 25 missions. Do the math and you'll understand the fear that lived in every crewman's chest. Yet some B-17s kept flying. Some absorbed damage that seemed impossible and brought their boys home. Here's the intriguing truth that puzzled military commanders. Planes that made it back were often riddled with holes in specific areas. Wings, fuselage, tail sections. The logical response reinforced those areas with additional armor. But one statistician looked at those returning bombers and asked a question that seemed absurd. What if we're looking at the wrong planes? What if the real story isn't about where these planes got hit, but where the missing planes got hit, the ones that never came home? To understand why the B-17 became legendary, we need to go back to its conception. Boeing designed this aircraft with one revolutionary idea, survivability through firepower and structural integrity. The name Flying Fortress wasn't marketing, it was doctrine. The plane bristled with 13 50 caliber machine guns, could carry up to 8,000 pounds of bombs, and featured a design philosophy that prioritized getting the crew home alive. But the men who flew these fortresses came from every corner of America. They were farm boys from Iowa, factory workers from Detroit, college students from New England. Most had never been in an airplane before the Army Air Corps put them in one. They trained together, flew together, and faced death together. The bond between a B-17 crew wasn't just friendship, it was survival made manifest. Take the crew of Memphis Bell, one of the first B-17s to complete 25 missions. Captain Robert Morgan and his men flew through everything the Luftwaffe could throw at them, from November 1942 to May 1943. Or consider the Ye Olde Pub, a B-17 so badly damaged over Bremen that a German fighter pilot, Franz Stiegler, chose not to shoot it down, instead escorting it towards safety a moment of humanity in the midst of mechanized slaughter. These crews learned quickly that the B-17 could take punishment. They watched engines catch fire and keep running. They saw control surfaces shot away while the plane remained flyable. They experienced holes torn through the fuselage that you could throw a football through, yet the bomber held together. But they also watched their friends' planes explode mid-air, disintegrate under concentrated cannon fire, or spiral down trailing smoke and flame. The contradiction was maddening. Why did some planes survive while others, seemingly hit in similar ways, simply ceased to exist? The central concept that emerged from studying B-17 combat damage was survivorship bias, though that term wouldn't be widely used until much later. The principle is devastatingly simple. We naturally focus on what succeeded and survived while ignoring what failed and disappeared. When military analysts examined returning B-17s, they meticulously catalogued every bullet hole every piece of shrapnel damage, every torn piece of aluminum. Wing damage, check, fuselage hits, documented, tail section peppered with holes, all recorded. The natural conclusion seemed obvious. 
Add armor to the areas showing the most damage. Strengthen what's being hit. But mathematician Abraham Wald, working with the Statistical Research Group, looked at the same data and saw something entirely different. He understood that these returning planes represented survivors. They proved that aircraft could sustain damage in these areas and still fly. The real question wasn't where the survivors were hit, but where the casualties were hit. The planes that didn't come back, the ones that exploded over Germany that spiraled into the North Sea, that augured into French farmland, those planes couldn't tell their story. But Wald realized they were telling it anyway, through their absence. If returning planes showed minimal damage to engines and cockpit areas, it wasn't because these areas weren't being hit. It was because planes hit in these areas didn't return. This challenged everything traditional military thinking represented. For centuries, armies reinforced what they could see being damaged. Shields got thicker where swords struck, armor got heavier where arrows hit. But Wald's insight revealed a deeper truth. In modern warfare, the most important vulnerabilities are the ones you can't see because the evidence doesn't survive. The B-17's structural design inadvertently proved this principle. The aircraft featured redundant systems, multiple load-bearing structures, and what engineers call graceful degradation, the ability to lose functionality gradually rather than catastrophically. You could shoot holes in the wings and the plane would fly, though less efficiently. You could damage the tail and the pilots could compensate, but hit the engines, hit the cockpit, those strikes were executioners. This wasn't just about armor placement. It represented a fundamental shift in how America approached military problem solving. Instead of relying solely on combat reports and visible damage, analysts began using statistical methods to uncover invisible truths. They started asking not just what happened, but what might have happened that we're not seeing. The solution that emerged from Wald's analysis was counterintuitive, but life-saving. Reinforce the areas showing the least damage on returning aircraft. Had armor to protect engines, strengthen the cockpit area, improve protection for critical control systems, don't waste weight reinforcing sections that planes could survive without. This recommendation faced resistance. Pilots and crew chiefs looked at bombers returning with wings like Swiss cheese and fuselage damage you could walk through, and they wanted those areas better protected. It violated human instinct to ignore visible damage and focus on theoretical vulnerabilities, but the statistics were irrefutable. When the modifications were implemented, loss rates decreased. But here's where the story becomes even more fascinating. The gunners themselves had already figured this out in their own way. Ball turret gunners, squeezed into the small rotating turret underneath the B-17's belly, learned to track attacking fighters and identify their most dangerous approach vectors. Waist gunners, standing in the open fuselage with wind screaming past at 200 miles per hour, learned which enemy aircraft could kill you and which were just harassing. One particular insight came from Staff Sergeant Benjamin Franklin Hall, a waist gunner on Desert Rat flying out of England in late 1943. After his 15th mission, Hall started keeping a journal, not of his experiences, but of attack patterns. He noticed that Luftwaffe fighters using frontal attacks were far more lethal than those attacking from the side or rear, despite the B-17's impressive defensive armament. Why? Because frontal attacks gave German pilots clear shots at engines and cockpit, the kill zones Wald had identified statistically. Hall's observations, shared informally among crews, led to tactical changes. Formations tightened to provide overlapping fields of fire. Lead bombers got the most experienced crews, who could spot frontal attacks earliest. Gunners were trained to prioritize targets based on attack angle rather than simply nearest threat. These weren't official doctrine changes. They were survival adaptations that percolated up from the men actually flying the missions. The real insight wasn't just about armor placement. It was about recognizing that survival data is incomplete data. Every B-17 that limped home was a survivor, and survivors have bias. They tell you what you can live through, not what will kill you. The true lesson required looking at what wasn't there. The empty hard stands, the missing planes from formation photographs, the crews that never came back from milk runs that should have been safe. This principle extended beyond aircraft. America applied similar statistical thinking to convoy routing, analyzing which shipping lanes seemed safest versus which ones had the most survivors. They applied it to infantry tactics, studying not just wounded soldiers, but patterns in fatalities. They applied it to equipment design, 
recognizing that soldiers rarely complained about equipment that killed them instantly. The B-17's legendary toughness wasn't just engineering, it was the combination of good design and smart analysis. The plane could survive terrible punishment, yes, but only because American strategists learned to protect it where protection actually mattered. But let's not romanticize this story. The truth is more complex and darker than a simple tale of statistical triumph. Even with Wald's recommendations implemented, even with improved tactics and better armor placement, young men still died in horrifying numbers. The 8th Air Force suffered over 47,000 casualties during the war, more than 26,000 killed. The B-17 could absorb punishment, but it couldn't absorb everything, and the boys inside still bled and burned and fell from the sky. There's a moral question here that deserves examination. How much is a life worth in the calculus of war? Wald's analysis saved lives, certainly, but it also made bombing campaigns more sustainable, which meant more missions, which meant more exposure to death. Every B-17 that survived to fly again meant another mission into flak and fighters. Was survival a gift or a sentence? Compare this to the British approach. The Royal Air Force flying nighttime area bombing raids in Lancasters and Halifaxes faced different survival mathematics. Their aircraft were faster, less heavily armed, and relied on darkness for protection. British losses were proportionally similar to American daylight losses, but the missions were fundamentally different, targeting cities rather than factories, using area bombing rather than precision strikes. Both approaches killed aircrew at terrible rates. Both believed their strategy was the more humane option. Both were wrong about how quickly the war could be ended from the air. The philosophy behind survivorship bias analysis also reveals something uncomfortable about modern warfare. It's increasingly about optimization rather than valor, about statistics rather than courage. The same mathematical frameworks that helped save B-17 crews also made warfare more efficient, more calculated, more removed from the human consequences. When you reduce survival to probability curves and armor placement diagrams, you risk forgetting that each number represents someone's son, brother, husband, father. And there's a deeper question. Did focusing on survivability create a false sense of safety that encouraged more aggressive missions? The B-17 became known as the plane that could bring you home, but that reputation may have pushed planners to accept risk levels they might otherwise have questioned. When your equipment is legendary, when your survival rates improve, the temptation grows to push further, strike deeper, accept longer odds. Consider also what this reveals about institutional learning. The military had access to brilliant mathematical minds like Wald, yet it took until mid-war for these insights to gain traction. How many lives were lost to traditional thinking, to the assumption that what you can see is what matters? And more troubling, how many other invisible truths did analysts miss because they didn't know to look for them. The B-17 story is ultimately one of American industrial might and ingenuity, yes, but it's also a story about the willingness to send young men into meat grinders day after day, calculating acceptable loss rates, measuring success in destroyed factories rather than destroyed families. Every improvement in survival rates meant the campaign could continue. Every crew that came home meant the next mission would be flown. So why did America's B-17 survive so many hits when other bombers fell from the sky? The answer isn't just in the aluminum and rivets, the engines and guns. It's in the willingness to question what seems obvious, to look for truth in absence rather than presence, to understand that survivors don't tell the whole story. They only tell the survivor's story. That unnamed gunner's trick, whether it was Hall's pattern recognition or any of hundreds of other observations made by crews, who learned to read death in the angles of attack, represented something profound. It showed that the men flying these missions weren't just following orders. They were thinking, adapting, surviving through intelligence as much as courage. They were writing their own survival manual in blood and observation, passing lessons from crew to crew in ways that no training manual could capture. The B-17 flying fortress became legendary not because it was invincible, but because it could fail gracefully. It could lose an engine and fly on three. It could lose hydraulics and still be controlled. It could be torn and punctured and still hold together long enough to bring its boys home. But more importantly, it became legendary because America learned to protect it intelligently, to analyze failure as carefully as success, to look for truth in what wasn't there. Abraham Wald's insight about survivorship bias extended far beyond armor placement. 
It taught a generation of analysts that the most important data is often invisible, that absence can be as informative as presence, that what fails to survive can teach you more than what does. This lesson has echoed through decades of military strategy, engineering design, medical research and business planning. Every time someone asks, what about the ones that didn't make it back? They're channeling Wald's fundamental insight. But let's end with the men, not the math. Every B-17 that returned carried 10 men who got to see another sunrise, write another letter home, fly another mission, or, if they were lucky, finish their tour and go home. The plane was aluminum and engines. The mission was about boys from America who flew into hell and came back changed, if they came back at all. The trick wasn't just in the aircraft or the analysis. The trick was in understanding that survival is never guaranteed, only optimized. That courage isn't the absence of fear, but the willingness to climb back into that bomber knowing the odds. That every hole in a returning B-17 skin represented a hole that could have killed someone, but didn't, this time. The flying fortress kept flying because engineers built it tough, mathematicians protected it smart, and American boys flew it with a desperate determination to see home again. The holes in the wings could be patched. The holes in the formations where planes used to fly, those could never be filled. That's the real lesson. Not that the B-17 was invincible, but that Americans learned to give their boys the best possible chance to survive. And sometimes, on frozen days at 25,000 feet over Germany, with flak bursting black around you and fighters diving from the sun, sometimes that chance was enough. The B-17 survived so many hits because someone finally asked the right question. Where are the hits we're not seeing? And in that question lay the difference between mathematical curiosity and the lives of young men who deserved every advantage that genius could provide. That's why the Flying Fortress became a legend. Not just because it flew, but because it brought them home. 